Welcome everyone for another episode of Confabulating. Today with us, we have the pleasure to have Professor Catherine French. Professor Catherine French, uh, she took a BA in Carleton College, Northfield, Minnesota in 1984 with a major in history and MA in the Department of History at the University of Minnesota as well in 1989. And on the same institution in 1993, her PhD with a dissertation, local identity in the late medieval parish, the communities of Bath and Wells. Her fields of expertise are medieval Europe, social and cultural history, medieval religious history, women's history, medieval England, early modern England. And at the moment, Professor held the J. Frederick Hoffman, Professor of History and Associated Chair at University of Michigan. And her latest book is Household Goods and Good Households in Late Medieval, London Conception and Domesticity After the Plague, which we will be speaking about today. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, and thank you very much. This is very kind of you to be interested. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the genesis of this book and uh, maybe a little bit about why I hope it's important. Oh. Uh, this book was originally inspired by my own adventures in DIY. I, uh, I had a 200 year old house in the Hudson Valley uh, in New York State. And as I, uh, as I did a lot of bad decisions that previous owners had made on my house, I kept uncovering physical evidence for how differently earlier occupants had lived in the house. And I began to wonder how did medieval people live in their houses? Um, in particular, I, I, I understood that everywhere I had a bookcase, um, previous owners, early owners had had beds. Um, so, you know, th th I was living in the house really differently. Um, in 2011, I moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And as I worked on my much newer 80 year old house, a bigger question emerged. How did the rise in consumption after the plague change how Londoners lived in their houses? Well, the rise of consumption after the plague is not news, but the impact of, in, impact of increasingly cluttered houses on gender and behavior had not attracted a lot of attention. I focused on housekeeping because it's where increased consumption would have made an immediate domestic impact. Did you leave your things on the floor so that clothing mixed with pots and pans greasy for cooking? Or did someone sort things out and store them in some way? And if so, who did it and according to what priorities and categories? The ability to organize increasing amounts of stuff conferred a new kind of authority because it gave someone the power to decide what went where and why, which in turn are manifestations of values and worldview. While the work of managing bodies and things and the dirt and chaos that they create has been unproblematically defined as women's work, house homework is neither timeless nor ahistorical. What acts constituted housekeeping and who performed them are historically contingent decisions dependent on evolving notions of cleanliness, household hierarchy, and order, but also on attitudes towards bodies, especially women's bodies. The division or combination of housekeeping's various tasks and the value judgments leveled on them give housekeeping an intellectual and cultural history. When is cooking a skill? When is it drudgery? When is breastfeeding outsourced? When is it revered? Medieval moralists argued that well-governed urban households were essential for a well-governed city. This put women's behavior as a point of debate, thereby implicating houses, their furnishings, and housework in understanding what was a well-governed household. The book starts with a chapter on domestic life before the plague, and then moves to learning how to negotiate the effective and monetary value of things after the plague. I then have a chapter called Interior Decorating After the Plague, where I look at new, how new spaces such as parlors, counting houses, um, and multiple chambers uh, what was their impact on household interactions? And then I have three chapters um, on how post-play consumption shaped eating practices, childcare, and finally domestic piety. I argue that London's merchants and artisans navigated material culture's possibilities and constraints differently than the peasantry or the gentry. Their solutions drew on existing values, priorities, and expectations, but, but produce something new, an urban identity predicated not simply on emulation of their betters, but on the affordance, affordances of material culture, which led them to formulate and live their values. Medieval conduct literature and the law would have us believe that housework was always performed by women. Yet a major contention for 14th and 15th century moralists and modern historians is that merchants and artisans were routinely imitative of their betters. If imitation of the elites had any role in determining how merchants and artisans lived in their houses, 
we should not assume that women performed housework because men managed elite households staffed predominantly by young men. As servants, they gained valuable training that helped them form important social and political connections. And with wet nurses, nurses, and tutors, elite mothers did not do all the childcare. For their part, immigrants from the countryside to London would also have brought their own ideas about how to run a house, even as they purchase and use items that were new to them. Barbara Hanawalt found a strong association of peasant women with all aspects of household work while men worked in the fields. This was no unbridgeable divide as women helped in the fields when necessary and men did useful things around the house, but it was different from the way merchants and artisans organized their households in the first century after the plague. Finally, the legal categories of dowry and paraphernalia associated women with essential personal and household goods. While dowry and paraphernalia were designed to care for women in their widowhood, not a house, they set the stage for expanding the connection between women and various household items. Status, wealth, location, and the presence or absence of servants all determined household organization and who did the housekeeping and had implications for how specific tasks were gendered, privileged, and moralized. While moral literature and the law linked housekeep housekeeping to women, aristocratic models of household organization did not. I found that regardless of houses, house and household size, after the plague, London's merchants and artisans came to create a common way of living in their houses and engaged with their household and engaging with their household possessions. Through household management, Londoners enacted the values of industry, order, piety, and privacy, by which I mean the ability not to be seen, as in protecting trade secrets, praying or reading alone or socializing in limited groups in smaller spaces rather than in an open hall. A shrine in the chief chamber of a wealthy merchant shares the same logic of limited access and domestic devotion as a St. John's head stored in a chest next to a bed in a shared room. Papers and accounts in a chest share the purpose of a counting house. When John de Blancanet went bankrupt in 1359, the appraisers found eight chests in his modest two or three room house. In the third chest, he stored basins and ewers, candlesticks, dishes, and a wine pot. The same things that Alexander Plimley, a wealthy mercer, kept in the buttery of his 11-room house. Whether or not Blankany actually hosted people for meals in his tiny house, its size did not inhabit the logic, inhibit the logic of the buttery and the belief that hospitality and courtesy should guide the purchase of plate. Ultimately, the new regimes of household management that Londoners experimented with as they acquired more space and more things after the plague would become a way of living that outlasted memories of the plague. The source for materials for answering questions about consumption, household, and women in post-plague London pose challenges. Inventories and wills are the sources that seemed most promising for getting to the household level. However, England doesn't have anything like the chronological range of probate inventories that Dan Smale has for Luca and Marseille. So I used a combination of different kinds of inventories, those made for felons, bankruptcy, and probate. And then I think in the end, I, I came up with about 140 inventories, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less. At their best, inventories can let you feel like you're walking through a house with an appraiser. The rooms are listed and the contents given vivid details of color, material, construction, and decoration. A wainscoted chair of English oak with a lady's image on the back. Bed curtains of blue buckram stained with pelicans. Or a painted cloth of 46 yards with the story of Daniel, which a few entries later you realize is accessorized with cushions decorated with lions. But for all their detail and intimacy, however, they rarely let you see gender. Even inventories from women aren't appreciably different than those from men. The act of bequeathing movable goods and wills provides the ability to add a gendered analysis to consumption and household items. With London having a large number of wills, the issue was really more about developing a feasible sample. I used the wills of men living in London who identified themselves as citizens or as merchants or artisans and from women who identified themselves as the wives or daughters of citizens, merchants, or artisans. I also included the rare servant's will. The Chemistry Court and the Prerogative Court of Canterbury provide the majority of the wills I used in the book. As neither court has wills before the plague, I supplemented them with London's own Husting Court, 
which started in 1258. But because this court mainly deals with real estate, not movable property, I used them selectively. And my sampling yielded just over 3,000 wills from between 1258 and 1540. To track the decisions that men and women made about bequeathing their household goods, I entered all the wills in my sample um, that left movable goods into a relational database that allowed me to count and sort the wills by sample, year written and proven, the testator's first and last name, sex, marital status, occupation, and parish. I then, ent I then entered all the movable goods bequeathed in the will who received the bequest, their name, sex, and when given, the relationship to the testator. I categorized the bequeathed items in three different ways. The first and broadest category was type of movable good. And that was a category that I actually kind of had to go back and refigure as I, as I learned more about this. But it, it was a category that was initially informed by the way testators and appraisers categorize goods. What do goods appear on the inventory? We've got, um, you know, Naparu, we've got jewels. So I started with those categories and then tried to keep them pretty broad. The second tier was the name of the object. And that required some decisions to make an effective search category. For example, there were many kinds of cups. There are goblets, drinking horns, mazers, nuts, cups with covers, large ones, small ones, to name but seven ways testators describe them. Moreover, cups come in silver, gilt, Latin, wood, and ceramic. And wills are in both Latin and English, making many, many ways to name a cup. So I gave every item an English name and made the name of the object uniform to enable meaningful searches. So regardless of how the testator named the drinking vessel, I entered it as a cup under the larger category of plate. And then the third and final form of categorization was the entry from the will in the language the clerk used. So I could recover all those gener generalizations I had just uh, uh, created. I could uh, recover the details that the generalizations had just created. By far and away, the most common item bequeathed was clothing, which I tracked for the sake of completing the database, but which does not figure much into my, uh, does not figure much in my analysis in this book. The most common category of household good was plate, followed by napery, jewelry and dress accessories, furniture and furnishings, weapons, and finally books. Weapons, jewelry, and dress accessories, like clothing, are bodily items, but jewelry and dress accessories were important for domestic medicine, and items like paternosters were hung by beds. And I tracked them to learn about healing, childbirth, and domestic piety. Weapons, for their part, were displayed laid in halls to signal citizen status. These layers of categorization allowed me to compare the different ways that testators describe their bequests and track changes in materials and construction, such as the appearance of painted cloths in, 1420, in the 1420s, diaper woven linen towels in the 1440s, or cypress wood chests in the 1530s. It allowed me to see that men and women made different decisions about the disposition of goods. Women, for example, gave bedding to young people, while men gave it to family members. To be sure, there's a significant overlap in these two groups of beneficiaries, but these differences speak to how men and women thought about beds and, by extension, households. Men associated them more with lineage, while women thought about them in terms of starting households and families. Again, not unconnected, but pointing to women's particular perspectives on households. This database also exposed changes to gender coding of different types of household goods. Part of the process of adopting any new object or technology is deciding who is to use them. Proper use comes to be coded by status, but also by gender, which participants in the creation and the which participates in the creation and reinforcement of identities. In the first century after the plague, the gender coding of many new household furnishings was up for grabs with testators associating very few items with one sex or the other, weapons and books being the exception. Because women generally didn't fight and had lower rates of, rates of, lit, of literacy, the gender of these two categories of goods shouldn't surprise us. But in the first century after the plague, London testators gave the items most obviously associated with housekeeping, that is bedding, dishes, basins and ewers, napery, candlesticks and chests to men and women equally. Unlike weapons, testators thought the items most associated with housekeeping equally appropriate bequests for men and women. While the wife of a London householder likely had charge of organizing and managing the house and its contents, bequest patterns in London, London do not show a strong association of women 
with items associated with the actual labor of cleaning, heating, and sorting. In the middle of the 15th century, however, Londoners' bequeathing habits begin to change, with testators increasingly giving women basins and ewers, napery, chests, candlesticks, girdles, dishware, and bedding. Um, and when I actually discovered this, it was, it would really did, it was completely not expecting this. I was just running the numbers and I graphed, and then I was like, oh my God. And I had to like, email David Bennett. I was like, wait, this is what I've got. It's like, this is, and she was like, like, you got a book. Um, <laughs> then I had to take it to the stats people at my university to like, see if I really had a book. Cause like, okay, I think it's a book, but is this like statistically significant? And you did. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, they were very, high. they they did, they, they assured me it was statistically significant. Um, uh, there was, however, no commensurate change in how testators bequeathed cushions, hanging cloths, fancy cups called mazers, items which had value and which were also important to a properly furnished house. Thus, inheritance patterns for household furnishings did not change across the board. The items that testators increasingly gendered female were the items that played a central role in housework, from cleaning and feeding to healing and organizing. Part of learning to live with more stuff after the plague was learning to gender certain items. We can see this process in chests, one of the last items to become gendered female. Chests play a starring role in organizing and managing household stuff. They held things as varied as grain, clothing, bedding, and weapons. The utilitarian and ubiquitous nature of chests is indicated by the fact that while they are pervasive in inventories, both before and after the plague, but until the mid 15th century, they rarely appear as bequests. When they do, beneficiaries usually receive other things so the chest provides a mean for carrying away the inheritance. For example, in 1465, Thomas Mayer left his wife's goddaughter table linens, bedding, dishes, two dozen silver spoons, and the best chest. By the early 16th century, however, chests had become valuable in their own right and testators gave them on their own. In 1537, Elizabeth Whitwain remembered Margaret Barton with a bequest of chest under the chamber window, but nothing else. As chests become desirable items, testators increasingly associated them with women. Before the 16th century, men and women were equally likely to receive a chest as a bequest. In the 16th century, women received almost two thirds of those bequeathed. The continent had an older tradition of marriage chests that held a bride's dowry. In Florence, the marriage chest, the cassone, sported elaborate carvings or paintings. Servants displayed it when processing the bride from her parents' house to her new husband's house. London law created categorized chests as paraphernalia, but given all the other use for chests, they are still not items that Londoners specifically gendered female. The changing inheritance patterns imply that by the end of the 15th century, England was developing the idea of a marriage chest as well. Certainly both the number of Italians living in London and the trade ties between the two regions would have given Londoners a chance to learn of this tradition. And John Freeman left his daughter, quote, a joint chest that was her mother's in 1486. And in 1537, Roger Jones bequeathed chests to each of his unmarried sisters. Women's own deployment of chests in their housekeeping actively engaged family values and priorities and shaped household culture by creating and maintaining household hierarchies. Because she was in charge, Alice Kirkby could store her servants' coarse linen sheets in one chest and the finer ones that belonged on her bed in a different chest. Differences in quality and comfort, but also storage choices made household hierarchies. With their association with women and their central role in ordering a house, chests become a useful metaphor for women's bodies. Locked, they ordered and protected their contents, overflowing, broken, or filled with mismatched items, they signal a badly kept house and a promiscuous woman. Changes in bequeathing patterns start appearing in the 14, 1450s and coincide with a serious recession. This recession constricted employment at all manufacturing sectors, which Jeremy Goldberg argues disproportionately affected women because it led guilds to restrict wives from practicing their husband's trade and froze female immigrants out of workshop jobs. Both York and Coventry, where we have good surviving evidence, experienced a shift in the demographics of household servants from predominantly male to female at this time. And there seems to be a commensurate declining in the status. 
Um, if you have male servants, that's a little bit more high status. If you have female servants, this seems to be a decline in status. Um, as women could only find domestic work. It's likely that London experienced the same economic difficulties too, although the evidence is less conclusive. To some, to, so some of these changes in bequests probably reflect attempts by dying family members to help young female relatives set, out, set up a household in a difficult economic time. However, these changes persisted into the 16th century, thus naturalizing the association of women with houses and housework as both houses and many of their furnishings came to promote and symbolize marriage, purity, and patriarchy, values that housewives also promoted with their housekeeping abilities. By the mid 16th century, housewife was a label applied to a woman regardless of marital status. The term signified that a woman had the skills of housekeeping, something she might even have learned as an apprentice. And as such, the term became a means of judging a woman's reputation. The morality that came to be embedded in houses and their furnishings by the late 15th century was a negotiation informed by the least beliefs and priorities of medieval society and the realities of embodied needs inside the home. But in the first century after the plague, Londoners experimented with the possibilities created by increased consumption. It would take another profound economic crisis a century later for Londoners to think that basins and ewers, dishes and napery, and girdles were more appropriate bequests for girls and women than for boys and men. In this time of economic uncertainty, the largely illusory and seemingly timeless image of women managing the household and doing the housework provided comfort and certainty. The combination of rural traditions, ecclesiastical ideology, and economic forces pressing on urban households would have been difficult to resist. While demography and economics may have driven these changes, religious and conduct literature guided the path of change and justified the outcome. In coming to gender particular things, Londoners tapped into a religious and legal discourse that had long associated women with housekeeping, but that had not fully matched their lived experiences in pre-plague London. The recession of the mid 15th century, which shifted the labor markets, provided the impetus to align domestic experiences with moral ideologies. Taken together, changes in the mid 15th century appear as a backlash against the new opportunities and choices available to women in the first century after the plague. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is, it is very refreshing to see the, the way that you just went about the um, this whole research and uh, about the conception but maybe just for whoever is watching us to understand a little bit better and obviously starting the point of in, in London from uh, 1348 when we had the, the, the Black Death um, why did you choose the period after the Black Death just mm -hmm. so that people can understand what is the difference what happened on that transition well, this actually requires me to confess that, you know, my research design was not nearly as seamless and, and you know, upward as I sort of implied. Um, <laughs> I made like every single mistake in building a database you could. And I have like scraps of like four different databases. <laughs> uh, but I also changed jobs in the middle of this project. So when I started this, I really thought I was going to write a small little book using probate inventories from London, which are, I think the earliest one is like 1475. Um, and so you know, I, was gonna, I wasn't connecting it to the plague in particular, I was just gonna write about houses. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a frustrated interior decorator. And so, you know, <laughs> I write about houses. Uh, so I had already started this project using this later material. And then I moved. And, you know, I got the resources to make for a bigger project. And I began to think a little bit more about this. Um, and so then I decided, you know, I was actually kind of interested in this whole trajectory of the impact on women in houses after the plague. But I had all this research that I'd done after 1450 that I didn't want to get rid of. <laughs> so, um, and I have to say, I also didn't quite remember there'd been this major recession in 1450 when I started. This. I, I'm now, I've now put this on YouTube. I've now admitted I did not remember <laughs> 1450. What kind of historian am I? Um, but um, so, you know, I just thought, well, I'll just do the two centuries after the plague. My other books had all been two centuries, you know, from basically the player when records started. And I'll just go up to the Reformation and no, that's a nice, neat and tidy 200 years. Um, so I'll do that. 
Um, and then, you know, as I actually seriously began to read about like the economic sort of fluctuations, um, then I was like, oh, actually, this is a pretty interesting <laughs> <Makes sense. laughs> straddle. Oh, so good on me. I've like got this good time period. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So if, if, we, if we touch um, a basis when you speak about um, the woman and the relation that she had with, with the household in a sense, what can, from what you search and the, the stuff that you, you, you come up with, what is the role of the woman in, in the households during this period? Because there was a, a time that you mentioned that it will be probably not the best thing to assume that they will be in charge of. But at the same time, if, for example, the household is deorganized, it will be their owner who will be in question, let's say. So I think that in a, in a household, a merchant and artisan household, her primary responsibility is producing children. And so to some degree, she is in fact doing childcare. And we don't have a lot of evidence that um, urban women are hiring wet nurses. At least we don't have a lot of evidence in London that they're hiring wet nurses. So she's probably doing, you know, the childcare at the, at the beginning. If she's very prosperous, she's gonna have help. Um, but she's also obligated to help her husband. And some of these women are skilled artisans in their own right. And so, you know, they've got, they've got skill, they've got perhaps interests, they've got abilities. Um, their husbands need them to keep the business going. If their husband does a lot of traveling, they're managing the home front. Um, so they may, they may actually have people who will help them run the house and run the business, a little bit of both. But in the period before 1450, we have, have some evidence. Um, there is a, there's a, um, a merchant's account book that survives from the, this earlier period, and I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Um, it's in French, in law French. Um, but his servants that he's paying, he's got more male servants than female servants. And they're sort of a butler kind of figure that's clearly doing a lot of the running of the household. So I'm not making an argument that women are not doing any of this work before 1450 or before the plague. They probably are, but not in this sort of idea, this firmly fixed, of course women are doing this kind of way. There's a lot of other things women have to be doing. And so housework is just not, it, it can't be the priority and there isn't as much stuff. So it also isn't the priority in quite the same way. I mean, one of the signs of, of increased consumption that I found is that um, the numbers of, of pairs of sheets that you leave to someone increases. You know, in the earlier wills, it's like one pair of sheets. And then by the later wills, you're leaving four and five and six pairs of sheets. So like the households might be bigger, but also I suspect people are just changing their sheets more often. So there's more laundry to be done. So that all is more housekeeping. Now, who's doing all of that work? You know, who's doing the sorting? Who's doing the laundry? Who's doing the uh, beds are not standardized. So you have to figure out like, okay, which sheet goes on which bed? Um, so, so somebody's doing all that work. And sometimes it was women and sometimes it was men, but it wasn't sort of categorically and ideologically in practice. Um, it might have been in the Bible. I mean, Proverbs talks about the housewife. But it wasn't sort of on the ground. And so that's that's really the, I'm not trying, trying to make the argument that women were unimportant to houses, mm -hmm. but they were not connected in the same way that they are by the end of my study. No, and even with that little things, like you just mentioned the sheets, you can actually do, at least draw some conclusions and it will be probably impractical or impossible for, for the woman to be doing everything at the same time. Right, so, right. W which they are most capable of, but it, it will be impractical uh, uh, on, on, on that sense. Um, and obviously, the, the, for, for the, well, another conclusion that you probably could draw from that, the, 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 the growing of the items, the amount of items that you can actually have, for example, the sheets that you start with one and now you have like five or six, that probably can say that economically speaking, it was like quite um, a boom, let's say, and people suddenly had more uh, capability in London, obviously, always uh, um, uh, I mentioned London because it was your study, but it, they had more uh, possibilities to buy more stuff and to, and, and to, 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 to buy new items, new furniture. And, 
and these items are also repositories of wealth. I mean, you know, cloth is really expensive and valuable. And so, you know, just because the sheet wears out, you might demote it down, might maybe to a servant's sheet, or you might demote it down to rags, or you, or you might sell it. Away. Right, you're not going to throw away, and you might sell it. Um, or if your husband, you know, goes bankrupt, you know, all that stuff is going to be sold to pay oh, off the debts. So all of this is not only that that people have more money and they're they're choosing to spend it on more things, or they don't have to spend as much of their 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 income on food, um, but it, these are repositories of wealth in a time with li limited coinage. And, and I, I have this is more of a, a curiosity because obviously you have. Um, a chapter about foods. Um, and obviously in terms of the wheels, it will be easy to have like furniture, like loads, not so, probably so much food. So which type of sources did you use specific for the food and what type of discoveries did you have you then? So, so I don't see much food at all. Um, and there were some, some of the bankruptcy inventories did leave, you know, barrels of fish and some wine and things like that, because they were just, you know, like they had those, those accents for that, like those guys were in jail and their houses were being cleared out. And so everything was going. It so, will count, right? Um, but by, by and large, I didn't see much about food. And so the reading I did around food was really in the secondary literature. I read some archeological studies, you know, looking for pollen analysis, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I, um, I am interested in food and I don't, I mean, I, I, I know, Paul, I know you interviewed Paul Friedman. I watched his, his, <laughs> um, his conversation because yeah. that's how I know about his cats. Um, but, um, you know, and I love his work and he asked really interesting, good questions about food. I'm not brave enough to become an American historian. Um, and so I don't know what my food questions, you know, would be. I was interested in what I was able to see in about the changing styles of cooking in the house. Mm -hmm. That also was something I had not expected to find. But when I actually started plotting out, like what were the kitchen equipment that I was seeing and I was, you know, putting them up against what kind of house was it? Was it a, a house that seemed to be a hall house or was it a, a shop house? You know, you really saw that there was clearly changes in cooking that Different. was going on, which has implications for the kind of food that would have been brought into the house. But I didn't actually see much in the way of primary sources about food. Um, maybe the next book, you know, <laughs> maybe knows, uh, there'll right? be food in it, I don't know. Um, and, oh, Jean, please go. Precisely <laughs> about it. Um, to what extent can we say that everything could be tested and everything could be inherited and listed in a household list. And um, a second question um, about accounting and uh, statistics that uh, your analysis re required and that's apparently someone demanded to you. Um, what were the biggest difficulties of your analysis methodology? Um, and Again, with my first question, um, what could be uh, inherited and listed? So the, big, the biggest problem I had was with my denominators, like keeping it all straight. <laughs> like what was, you know, I start running some numbers and I was like, okay, what am I counting? Is this hall houses? Is this shop houses? Yeah, I believe. <laughs> 1450, is this after? Uh, so, you know, and I have like stacks of paper where I have my notes you know, as I, okay, my denominator for this count is this. And so like, so just keeping track of all that stuff, that is, that one level is just not how I thought my career would end up working. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, but you're right, but at a, sort of at a more um, significant level other than my number issues um, is that, you know, my sources are not all consistent. You know, they, I'm using sources in ways that they were not intended to be used. I wasn't really interested if the accounting all added up at the bottom of the inventory. I wanted to compare inventories across time. And, you know, when I had felon inventories, bankruptcy inventories, and probably, those were all created for, you know, different purposes. And so trying to, to get them to sort of be comparable 
was really the difficulty in figuring out what was the logic, because you're right, not everything in a household is going to be counted. Uh, especially in the bankruptcy inventories, there seemed to be a threshold of value of about a penny. So things that were worth less than a penny. Um, so I, I almost never saw ceramics. And I almost never saw wood um, unless it was mazers. And mazers are these fabulous um, drinking bowls. They're, they're made out of maple burls. And burls are this very sort of knotty growth on a maple tree. And they're really hard to work. And they make a beautiful grain. They're still they're still used by woodworkers today. Um, so mazers were like this very charismatic object that people really were quite obsessed with. Um, but that's really the only wooden objects I saw in wills. But we know, or certainly if you look at the Mary Rose and the, uh, the objects from the Mary Rose, there's tons of wooden objects. And if you look at the archaeological finds from Mollus, uh, for London, they find lots of wooden objects, spoons and stirring sticks and, you know, um, like most of the like stuff is double. in woods. I'm sorry, what? Most of the stuff you find in Mary Rose is woods. I, I, exactly. I focus my studies on, on Mary Rose, so yeah. Yeah, so, so none of that appears <clears throat> in the inventories. And so like recognizing that I'm only getting the sort of most valuable stuff um, was also something I really had to had to work work with. And at a certain level, that was kind of where that chapter on negotiating um, effective value and monetary value came from. I had some wills and inventories for the same person. And so was able to sort of see, this is the same object in the inventory as in the will, and then be able to compare how they talk about Trust, it. Yeah. Um, but, but there's a world of things that archaeology opened up to me that you just don't see in the written sources. Um, and so just being always aware that that was there. Um, and my guess is, you know, they did, if that stuff, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty disposable material. You know, you burn your wooden spoon and you throw it away or you use it to light the morning fire more likely. You don't <laughs> throw it away necessarily. But, um, but if your wooden spoons are working, you know, you might leave them to your daughter or to your servant, but they don't need to be bequeathed in any kind of legal fashion. Um, and so knowing that there's all of this other stuff going on sort of below my documents, um, that would be, I think, the second talent. So trying to get, be able to compare my sources, but also recognize what they're leaving out. Yeah, and that leads me to another question that um, I think this is one of those topics uh, that managed to have two sides. Um, First, I believe that um, it has to be studied uh, like you you did uh, in detail by itself. Uh, and on the other hand, it can only reach the maximum of his analysis um, when confronted with other realities. Um, so I ask you, um, are there similar words about this topic um, that related to, uh, but related to other countries or cities that you could uh, compare if something about wood or China's uh, are uh, in, uh, appear in a, a list of house goods or, and could you tell us a short list of bibliography uh, about that uh, if so, so I like um I like Renata Ago's book Gusto for Things I mean she's dealing with a later period um but she's also working with inventories and I found her book really really helpful in thinking through how to how to work with inventories in the end you know she's very interested in artwork you know so the final third of that book you know, she sets this lovely context about houses and then she's like, and then they have all this art on the wall. So art is not just an elite thing. Um, and I didn't see so much art in my inventories, but but I found her work really, really helpful. Um, uh, Dan Smale in his book on legal plunder, um, I think he also asked some really helpful and provocative questions about inventories. He's not so much interested in um, changes uh, around the Black Death or maybe he simply didn't see them. Um, so that doesn't figure as much in his book, um, but he too, you know, is trying to see like, are there religious objects? Do we see children in the inventories? 
His answer was no, he wasn't really seeing these things in his inventories. And I, I took those kinds of questions and his findings as a thing to look for when I was working on my own project. Um, there is, um, there's a book that came out recently. Um, it's, it's again, it's an Italian art historian, although she's, I think, Finnish. Um, and I'm, I'm blanking out on her name. And she did a similar kind of study, although her book came out after mine. So I didn't get to sort of like really use her book to, to help me. Um, but she's doing very interesting, careful work in comparing like tax registers with inventory. So she actually knows like really where her inventory people are located in the population and is interested in the, the relationship of artisans who actually manufacture art and what's their relationship to art. So the Italian historians are, and art historians have really done a lot of terrific work, but it always comes because they're interested in artwork. And I actually was really interested in just living in a house. And so I wasn't uninterested in art. Um, I just didn't really see very much of it or, or things that we would have classified as art as opposed to like religious objects that we might now use as art. But, you know, people had them in their houses more for devotional reasons um, than for, you know, decorative reasons. Although painted cloths are kind of a quasi, you know, they're quasi religious and quasi decorative and not all of them have religious themes. Um, so maybe that's where we're beginning to see some of the, the art come into the English houses, but we have so little information about what's on these tapestries and painted cloths, it's hard to know. Um. And, and I would like to ask as well, because we touch um, uh, basis in terms of the woman role in the household, if he is, he is like a preeminent role or if he will be delegated to someone else, but from what you searched, did you find, for example, if the men, or, or at least you could draw some conclusions uh, regarding the men in the household, did he have any type of um, active role on the household as well? Or what do you think from obviously what? Uh, so, what yeah, yes. I think that, I think that he did. Um, he's the one who controls the purse, purse strings. So at a certain level, he's doing all the buying of stuff. He may send his wife out to buy stuff or she may be able to go out and buy stuff but ultimately, she, you know, if she's a married woman, she doesn't get to, she doesn't get to make a contract. Um, it's really, you know, does she get to buy things on credit? That's actually quite a fraught issue. Um, so, the, so the, the husband, the guy, is actually quite involved in in managing the purse strings. Now, does he care about what the subject of his tapestry is? Well, some men. <laughs> do and some men don't so it's it's really hard to say that nobody does but i can tell you that all of these merchants and artisans especially the, the wealthier ones who are involved in their guilds and involved in city politics they are very very concerned about what kind of impression their house is making on anybody who comes to visit them and so i'm going to say that they've thought pretty carefully about what the image on the hall the, the great hall tapestry is or painted cloth you know, do they want it to be the Virgin Mary? Do they want it to be a, a classical if, reference? You know, do they want it to be the arms of the King of England? I mean, there's all kinds of decisions that, you know, have political implications. So again, you don't, you don't get to see, at, at a certain level, all you're seeing is men because most of the wills are written by men and most of the mm -hmm. inventories are from men. Um, so really, they're all over the place as the owners, as the writers of wills and things like that is really trying to see women into this um, because they're they're not as as populous. Um, they don't populate the documents as as much as the men do. Um, but there were some inventories that were really evocative of personal preference. Um, so I have one will, um, and it's um, he's a he's a mayor, um, and he and his second wife do not get along. Um, and, and it, he says in his will that he's leaving these fabulously expensive, um, uh, uh, low country tapestries to his son and he's leaving, you know, he's not cutting a second wife out of his will. He's not allowed to do that, but he says, if she messes around with the will, she is cut out completely and she specifically doesn't get the tapestries. So, and when you look through their house inventory, you can sort of see that, now things are a bit tatty, but 
he's got a study that is really, it seems like that's his place. And then there's one, the bedroom they mentioned, there's a woman's mirror. Items are very rarely gendered by label. I mean, the gendering of objects, I really only see through bequeathing pattern. But to say, oh, a woman's mirror or a woman's you know, bed, you just rarely see that. So there's this woman's mirror in the bedroom and you kind of, and they well, both these rooms have, have fireplaces and you kind of sort of feel like of a cold evening, he's in his, you know, in the parlor with his fireplace and she's in the bedroom with, you know, her rose, rose her cushions decorated with roses and they are just not talking to each other. So that seems you know, kind of evocative of family dynamics and personal preferences and, you know, years of acrimony and, and you know, lost sort of happiness, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so in some of these cases, you feel like you are seeing like the preferences. Uh, it's not just like this man has been saddled with, with things from, you know, that he's inherited, but that he, you know, these are things he chooses to have. Um, I have another will in which the, the, the guy, he's dying. I think he's engaged, but he's not married at the time. He's like, but he has all these things from his mother's will. And he says, and they're from my mother's will, but his mother's will survives. And we know, yeah, she left all of this stuff to him and he's kept it. And now he's bequeathing it on. But he's also bequeathing it on to family members. So these objects that were, you know, things that make him think of his mother are being passed on to his sister and other brothers um, so they can still have this stuff. Um, and, and this is not, I mean, this is stuff with some value, but we're not talking, you know, gold rings and, you know, I mean, it's a set of, of monogram sheets is one of the things that he's passing on. You know, I talk over my mother and I'm sending them on to my sister. Um, so I think everybody is kind of invested in the, the, the decoration and blinginess of, of the stuff that's now available. And from obviously from the, <clears throat> what you research and in terms of wills, obviously if we are checking the lower um, classes, so population probably will not find uh, so many wills or many information. Um, but in terms of your study, would you would you range it in more of a middle class type of it, or do you go like lower classes as well? the same way that obviously you go to do like a sort of high middle class. I stuck with merchants and artisans because, <laughs> not because I was necessarily like driven to study merchants and artisans, but because um, those were a group I could get a handle on in terms of the sources. Yeah. You know, non-citizens in London are really, really hard to, to get at, at this kind of, of level. You know, they don't have enough to go into bankruptcy um, you know, they're not, they're not citizens, they're not members of companies. Um, so for the reason I'm writing about merchants and artisans is because I could kind of get a handle on their status. Um, I am working on, a, I am working on a new project where I hope to be able to get at, um, non-citizens. Um, but, um, oh, nice. it's, it's much harder since they're not leaving wills in, you know, they're not being inventory. I mean, we see them in court cases, but if you're interested in their daily life, then, you know, that court cases are not really the daily life. So the problem with, with the felony uh, inventories is that probably they are in fact poorer than sort of the overall groups of people who are being inventoried. And so that's a little uneven in terms of a comparison, um, but the felony inventories are some of the few inventories I have from before the plague. Um, so again, you know, yeah, I'm working yeah. with what I'm working. It's not like I was leaving behind some really good set of sources or some <laughs> not so good set of sources. Like the sources just weren't as, as rich from before the plague. Um, yeah. But the, what I think I'm also arguing by looking at merchants and artisans that that's those are two. I mean, they're you know, merchants are higher up than artisans, absolutely in the hierarchy of London. But I'm arguing for actually a common culture that they're engaged in rather than seeing that economics is solely driving uh, sort of urban identity. I'm actually trying to make an argument that they are gonna share a lot of commonalities mm -hmm. in how they live in houses and how they op operate their houses and how they think about houses as a reflection of honor and order and virtue and piety and things like that. Um, so that's really one of the things I'm trying to do is to, to bring them together.
together, whereas often they are separated, studied separately uh, because of these of these wealth differences. Definitely, and uh, obviously you can draw some comparisons as well because yeah. I think people sometimes when they look at history they look at it something that is closed and you cannot draw any conclusions. But it's a science, right. so you can actually. And right. that is when the refreshing stuff comes up, like the book you did, because uh, if you look at the point of of view of sociology and even uh, anthropology. You can actually draw some conclusions of how the human being operated, and probably because obviously, like you have the the merchants and and um, the, the 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 lower ones, uh, uh, probably you will be able to draw some conclusions and some similar similarities of the furniture and stuff they will have on their houses. Obviously, probably someone who had less possessions will still have whatever he needs, but in less quantity right. and quality. Right, so you, you might not get an alabaster St. John's head, but you could have a little metal one, but it's still St. John's head. Um, so that's really, you know, that there are more affordable versions, but everybody wants it. And this is also part of my, my unhappiness with an argument only about emulating your betters. Because at a certain level, um, you know, you accuse merchants of emulating the aristocracy, and then you go, well, you know, and they're their, their wives are having fancy lying in chambers and, you know, they're calling on physicians to help with the childbirth and things like that. And I'm sorry, but wanting the best health care for your child should not be considered emulation of your betters. Exactly. That's just wrong. You know, mm -hmm. Wanting to have a comfortable house and a full meal and a safe place to live, you know, not emulation of your betters. I, I find that to be such an elitist position. Um, so, think about like what is sincere emulation and what is like human wanting to be safe and comfortable in a sense i think we do that nowadays as well we always try yeah. to do our best to be similar to our best in a sense so yeah definitely i think that is part of being a human in a sense right so so at a certain level yes if i wanted to live on park avenue in a penthouse i would be emulating somebody who i am not okay but, you know, the person on Park Avenue also wants to be safe. And I, living in my little house in Ann Arbor, I want to be safe. Am I emulating them? I don't think so. Agreed. Definitely. And uh, as a curiosity as well, because obviously you went through so many wheels, do you have like a number of peculiar objects that you find or that you found on the on that wheels that you remember, and maybe a, a peculiar uh, wheel that you still remember? So, so actually, I do. I have I have a couple of favorite ones. So I have um, so there's there's a um, there's a father who leaves his son a unicorn horn. Um, <laughs> And, you know, he's got the long one and then there's the broken one and he's leaving that to somebody else. And I thought, oh, you know, he has a unicorn horn. Isn't that adorable? Um, so, um, so there's that one. There's, there's also some, there's some women's wills that are really just remarkable because they, they're so detailed. Uh, I have one woman who she's got eight sons and she's leaving, she's doing, she, she clearly likes and so she's got a set of mazers and a set of girdles and a set of paternosters and a set of spoons. And she divides them all up amongst her sons. So they all get like the same thing. Um, and then you know, like all the napery is bundled together in one big sheet and she labels with a piece of paper and she pins the label onto the sheet so that each son knows which bundle is his. Um, and so her will really sticks with me for it's just detail about trying to be fair to her sons in a world that, you know, older sons really do get more. Um, but also, like, you can just see her pride in, you know, I ordered before midnight tonight, and I got all 12 of those apostle spoons. Um, so you get to see her sort of love of having sets of things. Um, those, those detailed wills of, the, of these women um, kind of stand out because they're are so vivid you, you feel like you're getting to like through the wills the women really are writing about themselves I mean they're constrained by you know legal formula but the ways in which they apportion their stuff the way they describe it they're they're you know being as detailed and loving about their house and what they've got in it as any home renovation show on tv 
and I kind of I kind of love that. Um, and finally, Mazers. I just they were the first thing I sort of glommed onto, and they're just so cool. Um, I keep hoping that at some point, you know, my partner who is handy will will make me a Mazer so I can have one. <laughs> they're they're just super neat, and and people in the Middle Ages are really they love them. They they describe them so lovingly, and they often describe who ha who gave it to them, and they have names sometimes. And so yeah, Mazers one of my favorite objects that came out of this study. And obviously, like you said, it, it will be. Uh very difficult not to say impossible for them uh, for for example a husband not leaving anything at all to the wife however from what you see on the on the wheels could you see someone that or some people that clearly if they could they will leave absolutely nothing and they just try to leave the minimum that is possible so there are there are wheels where the husband says you know if you mess around with the will you're cut out uh, it's not clear to me that they can actually really do that Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know legally that you can, you know, the law says you have to leave, you know, your wife a third. So I'm not convinced they can actually, come, but clearly, you know, there's a lot of unhappiness in, in those relationships. I have some wills also where the mothers clearly are having problems with sons and they're saying, you know, if you mess with the will, you get nothing. <laughs> um, so there are attempts to try and control from beyond the grave. Um, a lot of wills from men are really, really brief, but that's also because they don't have to be detailed. Uh, the law doesn't require them to be specific. And they could have been, you know, they could have been loving and kind and generous and all those kinds of things, but they just dispatched with all that stuff, you know, orally. And, and so, you know, don't need to, to, to delineate it. Um, that would be another problem with using wills, um, you know, as a source. They do not reveal everything that was in the, the estate. I mean, I know that, but, you know, again, it's what I got. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can, in a sense, have a sort of, with that wills and with that objects, even draw some conclusions about the relationship and, and yeah. maybe go a little bit further. In a right. sense. I, have, I have one man who has, who's leaving the Mazer not to his eldest son. He's leaving it to his daughter. Um, and he Ooh. describes the Mazer detailed enough that you think it's, it comes across as being pretty, pretty special. But he also tells you that he's paying off his eldest son's debts. And so you're like, oh, you know, the Mazer's really important. And he thinks that his daughter's going to hold on to it more than his, than you know, his son. son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is quite funny because in a sense, you can even see some similarities with nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> in a sense. Well, our time is uh, reaching the end, Professor. I, I probably would like to do a final question um, regarding the um, um, interdisciplinary in terms of, because your research, you actually did that because you had to go to archaeology. Um, do you think it is important nowadays uh, for this type of history approaches in terms of research to use these interdis interdisciplinary uh, methods and to go and drink a little bit in different other sciences uh, other than just history? I would say yes. Uh, if you want, if you ask questions that traditional methods can't answer, you're either just not going to answer them and that just seems sad and disappointing, um, or you're going to have to go and, you know, read around in other disciplines that will help you answer these questions. Um, and so I would say that You call it interdisciplinary, but really it's just history is using what it can to answer the questions that it has. And so if I go to archaeology, um, it's because I want to know about wooden objects and nobody's writing about them in the surviving sources, but I know they were in the houses. And so I'm going to have to go and use that. Uh, the problem with, of course, going to these other disciplines is that you know I'm not trained as an archaeologist. I'm definitely not trained as, trained as a statistician. So uh, there's a chance that I'll do it badly. I hope I, you know, I went to the stats people to, to make sure that, you know, I could make some claims based on my numbers because the last thing I wanted was some, some book reviewer to go, yeah, but, you know, I did a mm -hmm -hmm analysis and, you know, her numbers don't show anything. So, you know, you, you have to also talk to other people and bring other people into your, into your work 
So collaboration, even if it's not overt co-authoring, I think is also really key. If you want to play in these other disciplines, you have to learn some of the rules or ask the experts. Uh, but, but, you know, I have these questions and, and traditional historical methods tell me that, you know, I can't study women. Well, you know, I want to study women. I want to know what women were doing. Um, traditional methods are why so many um, underrepresented groups are not studied. I mean, we know that there are Blacks in medieval London, but it's hard to see them. And until we start asking those questions, we're not, you know, we're not going to see them. And until we start using other kinds of methodologies that will help us see them or help us read our documents that do survive in smarter ways or more innovative ways, we're not gonna be able to answer those questions. And we're going to end up with these really sort of very traditional um, answers to questions that you know, are not really the answers that we're looking for. Or, or sometimes just to um, the right question or different questions to sources that are already there, but no one thought about doing that question to that source in a sense. Right. Right, I mean, there's a world of people who have written about how we can't use wills because they're so formulaic. <laughs> well, okay, so we can throw away this source that, you know, we've got thousands of them. It is the, the best repository of women's writing that we've got. And we could simply go, well, no, all right, fine. We're not gonna use them. Or we can figure out how we can use them to get at what matters to women. I feel like I came upon a way of thinking about how objects were described. You know, what's Definitely. the internal logic of each will? Uh, when a woman gives you just all this detail about her household stuff, clearly in some way it's important to her. So why is it important? What is that importance that, that you know, then what can I do with that insight? Definitely. Yeah. Professor, I don't know if you want to do any final remarks so we can end up the, our interview today. Um, no, but thank you for inviting me. <laughs> uh, I was really, I'm really thrilled that, that this worked out. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, thanks. So, well, welcome. We need to thank you. So what I will do is I will put uh, Professor French book um, the link on the the description on on the video, so everyone can go and buy it. It's amazing, and it's worth it. <laughs> and the they did such a lovely job. The cover is so beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Just a me. beautiful book. Yeah, it's quite gorgeous. Um, <laughs> So and you'll send me a link to, to this when it when it goes up. I will. So Excellent. just just to end, thank you everyone and until the next confabulating. Thank you so much.